Summary of How to Think Like a Philosopher Scholars, Dreamers and Sages Who Can Teach Us How to Live by Peter Cave, written and narrated by Janky Mind Introduction How to Cultivate a Philosophical Mindset draws upon the wisdom and experiences of historical thinkers, offering unique insights into the concepts of beauty, truth, and the very essence of reality. It unveils philosophy as a deeply human quest for meaning, encouraging everyone to embark on their own intellectual journey. At its essence, philosophy has always grappled with life's profound questions, such as why something exists rather than nothing or how to discern truth. Although our contemporary lives differ significantly from the days of Socrates in ancient Greece, the fundamental inquiries about the universe and our role within it have remained remarkably consistent for millennia. However, this constancy in questioning does not imply stagnation. Across time and cultures, the answers to these questions have undergone radical transformations. Philosophy is not confined to musty old tomes, it represents an ever-evolving, perpetually challenging discourse on the nature of reality. Philosophers aren't the only ones who engage in this introspective pursuit, poets, mathematicians, novelists, economists, psychologists, and historians have all ventured into the realm of contemplative thought, unearthing profound truths in the process. From ancient China to post-war Paris, the art of philosophical contemplation has left an indelible mark on music and art, prompted uncomfortable inquiries, and catalyzed revolutions. More significantly, it has inspired countless individuals to lead lives imbued with greater purpose, awareness, and intention. This audiobook eschews dry, academic treatises, instead delving into the ideas and personalities that have shaped civilizations, some of which sent shockwaves through history. Through its pages, you'll not only gain an understanding of these philosophical giants but also learn to adopt their perspectives, enriching your own life with their profound insights. Chapter 1, Embracing Paradox, Lao Tzu and Spinoza Picture commencing a book by asserting that its subject is fundamentally beyond words. It may strike you as peculiar, yet that is precisely how Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching begins, it boldly proclaims that words are inadequate to capture the profound essence of Tao, loosely translated as, the way. This enigmatic and lyrical text, which emerged in 6th century BCE China, has mystified many with its paradoxes and riddles. It contends that Tao, or the ultimate reality, is ineffable and transcends description, perpetually eluding human comprehension. The author of this work remains elusive, much like the concept of Tao itself. Lao Tzu simply means old master, suggesting that it may not represent the work of a single individual. Yet, the anonymity of the author does not diminish the impact of their words. The ancient text employs enigmatic puzzles and metaphors to gesture toward realities beyond our grasp. It is replete with perplexing analogies, likening the governance of a vast nation to cooking a small fish, illustrating how it is easy to overdo things. It also likens Tao to water, as it flows into the deepest recesses, nurturing all things equally. These cryptic verses allude to a particular way of existence, one where nature serves as the true window into reality. However, achieving the requisite mental and spiritual tranquility is imperative for true observation. Much like in Buddhism, liberation from desire is deemed necessary to fathom the mysteries of reality. Despite its emphasis on the way, the book has often been construed as a religious text, even though it posits that religion arises when humans lose sight of Tao. If the genuine nature of reality is as elusive and unknowable as Lao Tzu suggests, it is inevitable that philosophy and religion intersect in more than just ancient China. Consider the experiences of the 17th century philosopher Baruch, also known as Bento, Spinoza. 
Born in Amsterdam in 1632 to Portuguese Jewish immigrants, Spinoza's philosophy starkly contrasted with the beliefs of his family and the Jewish community. He maintained that any concept of God could not be divorced from the natural world. Much like Lao Tzu centuries earlier, for Spinoza, nature and the universe itself constituted the true reality, and he paid a steep price for this belief. Excommunicated from the Jewish faith at the tender age of 23 following the publication of his work Dea Siv Natura, God or Nature, Spinoza became a complete outcast. His Jewish heritage had already estranged him from Dutch society, and his expulsion from Judaism left him devoid of any community. In response to his suffering, Spinoza chose kindness. His personal trials deepened his empathy for others. In certain respects, his outcast status furthered his philosophical pursuits. Freed from external influences, he developed a perspective on reality that bordered on pantheism, everything in his world was a facet of God, even those who rejected him. For this, he was vehemently denounced as both a godless atheist and a religious zealot. In 1670, he anonymously penned a treatise titled Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, though everyone who read it immediately recognized the author as Spinoza. Within its pages, he advocated for principles such as freedom of speech and a secular society. It was at this point that he was branded blasphemous, an extraordinary label for an individual who had been formally exiled from religion. So, how can one cultivate the mindset of Lao Tzu or Spinoza? Begin by opening your eyes to the wonders of nature and the world around you, and quiet your mind to absorb it all. Chapter 2 Earthly Wisdom from Aristotle and Epicurus Ancient Greek philosophy stands as one of the most renowned intellectual traditions worldwide, with luminaries like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle whose names continue to adorn universities and centers of learning more than two millennia since their passing. While their philosophy might evoke lofty ivory towers, some of these thinkers aimed for a more down-to-earth perspective. Let's begin with Aristotle, a devoted pupil of Plato, who spent his early years at Plato's academy, absorbing the teachings that stemmed from the work of Socrates. Given his prestigious lineage, it's no surprise that Aristotle's body of work is extensive, spanning diverse subjects such as medicine, astronomy, chemistry, biology, and beyond. In 347 BCE, Aristotle departed Athens to embark on a journey of research and data collection before returning in the mid-330s to establish his own school of philosophy. Known as the Peripatetic School, it took a distinctive approach by having Aristotle lecture publicly in various locales around Athens. Unlike Plato's highly formal academy, Aristotle's school engaged with everyday people on their terms. In contrast to Plato, who posited that genuine forms of humanity existed beyond the physical realm, in the form of souls or spirits, Aristotle resisted hastily dismissing the physical reality. He found fascination in the myriad forms of existence he encountered and accorded them equal significance. He pondered the distinctions between being a horse, a human, or even an object like a gold ring. Aristotle challenged Plato's spiritual interpretation of ultimate reality with a more grounded proposition, what if, instead of being spirits or souls seeking reality, we are reality itself? This led Aristotle to emphasize ethics, being kind to others and to the natural world, alongside health and harmonious coexistence with one's physical body. This mindset mirrors that of another Greek philosopher with a distinct reputation in the modern world. When we hear the term Epicurean, we might envision someone reveling in excesses of wine, sumptuous food, or sensual pleasures. However, this image sharply contrasts with the ideals of Epicurus, the philosopher who inspired the term. 
Epicurus settled in Athens in his thirties, following a youth spent in Colophon, a city in modern-day Turkey. He is now recognized as an automist, believing that everything in the world, including the spirit or soul, comprised minuscule particles. Naturally, the soul consisted of finer particles than the body, accounting for its elusive nature. A profoundly materialistic thinker, Epicurus observed that children were driven by the pursuit of pleasure, leading him to postulate that pleasure was at the root of the impulse for life and the foundation of a good life. But what did pleasure mean for Epicurus? It seemed to be the mere absence of pain. Excessive pursuit of pleasure, such as overindulgence in wine, often resulted in pain, making it something to be avoided. Epicurus' philosophy does not advocate indulgence, rather, it extols simplicity. He believed that a contented life could be achieved by aspiring to less. The pursuit of more invariably brought suffering to oneself and others, so why not cultivate a garden instead? Its simple beauty would nourish both body and soul. To think like Aristotle or Epicurus, one must balance a grounded curiosity about the world with kindness toward oneself and others, seeking to alleviate suffering wherever possible. Chapter 3 Reflections on Alienation with Marx and Nietzsche While philosophy often sought answers in the natural world, some more modern thinkers turned their gaze toward the intricacies of human society to uncover the true essence of reality. They scrutinized systems like mathematics and language or delved into history to seek the meaning of life. For Karl Marx and his collaborator Friedrich Engels, the true reality of modern existence was embodied by industrial capitalism. Although Marx's works were largely categorized as economics, his ideas left an indelible mark on modern philosophy, even though he distanced himself from the revolutions that co-opted his ideas across the globe. Marx critiqued philosophers like Spinoza, who regarded humanity as a fixed category rather than an evolving entity. For Marx, reality was shaped by the prevailing conditions of contemporary life. Material circumstances, such as how people worked and what they received in return, constituted the underlying reality of industrial society. However, it is perhaps in his concept of alienation that Marx fully enters the realm of philosophy. He astutely observed that in a profit-driven industrial system, workers must be compensated less than the value of the products they produce, with the surplus going into the capitalist's pocket as profit. Consequently, workers became estranged from the fruits of their labor. Worse still, they had no control over what they did or when they did it. In fiercely competitive workplaces, they were even set against one another, further alienating them from their fellow workers. In the late 19th century, it wasn't just the workers who felt alienation. With Friedrich Nietzsche's proclamation, God is dead, it seemed as though everything was alienated. Nietzsche's semi-autobiographical work, Eki Homo, Behold the Man, was both incredibly provocative and grandiose. Its chapter titles, such as, Why I Am So Clever, and, Why I Write Such Excellent Books, reflected his style. Nietzsche, a philosopher of aphorisms, pithy, concise statements, was known for memorable sayings like, Some men are born posthumously, which showcased his sharp wit and a certain irony in his approach to Western philosophy. Indeed, his declaration, God is dead, was presented in all capital letters. As if shouted from the pages of, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. This work even inspired Richard Strauss to compose his 1896 tone poem of the same name, famously featured in Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. Such bold philosophy demanded equally dramatic music. Nietzsche's proclamation about the death of God had little to do with the existence of a supernatural being, rather, it was a commentary on the state of society at the time. 
He essentially warned that once religion ceased to be the foundation for social morals, society risked descending into chaos unless it found alternative unifying ethics. So, how can one think like Marx and Nietzsche? Firstly, embrace the idea that every system, whether it's religion, language, or industrial capitalism, can be dissected to reveal an underlying reality. Yet, maintain a sense of humor during this exploration, because human behavior often unfolds with a sense of irony. Chapter 4, Contemplating Love and Sex with Sappho and de Beauvoir Though the Greek poet Sappho may not typically be associated with philosophy, her poetry reveals a profound philosophical sensibility. She earned the title of the Tenth Muse from luminaries like Socrates and Plato due to the excellence of her writing. Through her verses, she brings a rich philosophical depth to notions of love and beauty, infusing them with powerful significance. Sappho employs eloquent terms like bittersweet to capture the essence of attraction and desire. Her poetic descriptions, featuring vivid imagery of fluttering sensations in her chest, the subtle fire coursing over her skin, or her ears buzzing in the presence of her beloved, provide readers across the ages with an intimate glimpse into the visceral experience of love. In Sappho's worldview, love and beauty were intricately woven into the fabric of philosophy, constituting integral aspects of true reality. In her poetry, she also portrays the loss of love with poignant clarity, equating it to physical pain that can drain life of all its joy, leaving behind a desolate grief. Sappho's perspective on the profound connection between love and loss, viewing them almost as twins, stands as a timeless truth. Her unflinching observations of the vulnerability of love and the irrationality of human behavior under the influence of intense emotions continue to resonate. Similarly, novelist and philosopher Simone de Beauvoir dedicated her life's work to the meticulous examination of the realities of women's lives. Her uncompromising accounts of systemic oppression, as presented in The Second Sex, solidified her status as an early feminist icon. However, she resisted this label because her concerns extended beyond the conditions of women, they encompassed men's lives as well. Her relationship with fellow philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre positioned her at the heart of the French existentialist movement, a group of philosophers who took Nietzsche's declaration that God is dead seriously. This proclamation gave rise to a fundamental crisis, if God no longer existed, did that mean anything was permissible? De Beauvoir's resounding answer, akin to Nietzsche's, was a firm no. In a world without God, she believed that individuals bore the responsibility to act ethically and morally simply because everyone deserved freedom. This might seem paradoxical, but in a world where everything is permitted, safeguarding the freedom of all and empowering them to make choices about their lives became paramount. A moral society, according to de Beauvoir, preserves the freedom of every individual and grants them the autonomy to shape their destinies. One of her notable concepts was the appeal, signifying that freedom necessitates persuading others to align with shared ideals. De Beauvoir forcefully emphasized that no person is an island, and this applies equally to women. Her call for mutual recognition of the self and the other remains a powerful plea for equality and diversity. So, how can you think like Sappho and de Beauvoir? Firstly, recognize that humans aren't as rational as we often believe, and all of us can act irrationally under the sway of emotions. Secondly, strive to empathize with the experiences of others as deeply as you understand your own, as this is the path to ensuring everyone's freedom. Summary Indeed, philosophy is an ongoing and dynamic discourse that engages with life's profound inquiries. To think like a philosopher, one must embrace the wonders of nature and maintain an open mind, much like Spinoza or Lao Tzu.
Alternatively, staying grounded and inquisitive while conversing with people from all walks of life, akin to Aristotle or Epicurus, can foster a philosophical perspective. Empowerment can be achieved by contemplating the concept of alienation and choosing cooperation over chaos, following in the footsteps of Nietzsche and Marx. Finally, finding meaning in relationships, along with the accompanying joys and sorrows, as advocated by Sappho and de Beauvoir, is another path to a philosophical mindset. In essence, philosophy invites us to explore, question, and contemplate the myriad facets of existence, encouraging us to think deeply and critically about the world around us and our place within it. This audiobook summary was brought to you by Janky Mind, we hope you enjoyed it.